Welcome to the Kotki Ride Home for Wednesday, June 30th, 2021. I'm Jackson Bird. What's with the ongoing trend of horror films and TV shows being set in the 1980s? Is sunscreen worse in the United States compared to Europe? And one of the sports returning to the Olympics next month has a deadly precedent. Here are some of the cool things from the news today. Starting most popularly with Stranger Things in 2016, though it certainly began before that, the horror and sci-fi genre has been riding a wave of 1980s nostalgia that just won't let up. After Stranger Things, we got two new It adaptations. There were less popular movies like Summer of 84, and then Ryan Murphy hopped on the bandwagon by setting season 9 of American Horror Story in 1984. And now Netflix is continuing the nostalgia train by releasing a trilogy of movies called Fear Street, based on R.L. Stein's novels of the same name for older teenage readers than his Goosebumps series. And those three movies, the first of which premieres this Friday, each take place in a different year, 1978, 1994, and 1666, but all follow the same story and are centered around the same town. Now, setting aside the 1666 installment, you get a full dose of 80s adjacent nostalgia from the other two when you watch the trailer. And personally, I can't wait to watch these Fear Street movies because I am a total sucker for 80s films, old or new. And based on the unending rush of 80s period films, especially in the horror genre, I know I'm not alone. But why is it so popular? Well, one of the most obvious and underlying reasons for this is simply that a lot of the filmmakers at the helm right now grew up in the 80s. If you're a Gen Xer who wants to make a movie about what to you feels like the most quintessential time of childhood or adolescence, you'll probably go back to your own, which was in the 1980s. And considering how many people in the prime consumer age range also either grew up then or just missed it and think it's pretty cool, it makes sense that it would be popular. You know, people enjoy the pop culture references, the old product placement, the sense of humor, the fashion, and when a current movie set in the 80s tries to return to the old school special effects instead of relying on CGI, even better. But Mara Bachman, writing in Screen Rant last summer, also argues that the 80s were, by far, the best decade for horror films. Bachman points to the expansiveness of the genre in that decade and the splintering into subgenres, and how it started being taken more seriously, up until about 1996 when Scream hammered the nail in the coffin of pure horror and paved the way for satire, critique, and what one could maybe even call the more recent prestige horror, you know, movies like Get Out and Midsommar. So if you want to play on any of the pure horror tropes, if you want to pay homage to some of the horror classics, the ones that defined the genre, you'd probably be riffing on a film made in the 80s. But there's another related reason in there. Part of what made the 80s so full of horror movies at the time, why it's such a good period to set horror films in in general, and why it's so popular right now in particular. Quoting Bachman in Screen Rant, Some of the popularity of the 1980s setting can be blamed on nostalgia and the desire for a seemingly simpler time in life. More often, it's based on interest in historical events that occurred at the time, such as satanic panic and serial killers from that decade. Two especially popular examples of this are Richard Ramirez in The Night Stalker and Jeffrey Dahmer. The decade itself was filled with real-life horror, and by utilizing it as a plot device, it elevates the terror of any film or television series, end quote. Horror historian Dr. Johnny Walker, a senior lecturer in media at Northumbria University and author of the upcoming Rewind Replay, Britain and the Video Boom, told The Guardian, quote, "...horror has always been socially aware and engaged." As a genre, it hinges on shock and, well, horror. Because of that, and because it's so inherently visceral, it's fertile ground for exploring confrontational, divisive issues. End quote. And this is now building on yesterday's segment about a post-Brexit wave of bands that sonically and tonally are reminiscent of the 1980s post-punk era, lyrically, emotionally a response to the perceived repressive politics and cultural shifts. Alex Godfrey, writing yesterday in The Guardian, says, quote, Today has largely been an era of populist right-wing governments, globally, and that chimes with earlier iterations of conservatism, certainly with Thatcher and Reagan. A case in point, 
Censor, an upcoming horror by the Welsh director Prano Bailey Bond about a traumatized film censor. It's set in 1985 Britain at the height of the hysteria around video nasties, many of which were banned. End quote. A quick note from me for anyone out of the loop. Video nasties refers to low-budget or homemade videotapes often depicting or accused of depicting violent or salacious content. Outrage about the obscenity ultimately led to the Video Recording Act of 1984, which had even stricter regulations than for films that were played in the cinema. The controversy and usage as a cultural debate and scapegoat was not unlike what happened with the PMRC, or Parents Music Resource Center, and Tipper Gore's implementation of the parental advisory labels here in the States around the same time. Anyways, back to Godfrey in The Guardian, quote, Mid-80s Britain under Thatcher, says horror historian Walker, was horrendous for many people. And while the moral panic was awful for the horror industry, it created a thriving community of genre fans. Censor plays with that dichotomy, with what was grim about the 80s, but also the excitement that surrounded the video nasties panic for the adolescents sharing pirate videos in the schoolyard. This, he says, speaks to why horror is so effective at investigating history, whether it's censor or stranger things making a meal of conspiracy and cover-ups. The foundations of the genre, the tropes, are able to be repurposed, he says, because inevitably in different epics there will be governments doing shady things, and with that, dynamic horror is able to flourish because it's got something to sink its teeth into. When you put video nasties on the front of a newspaper, it's a distraction tactic, telling people not to be scared of imminent unemployment, but of video cassettes. The 80s are so often dismissed as consumerism, but the movie Censor takes that superficial veneer and digs deeper, scraping back the MTV generation gloss. End quote. Conspiracy theories, cultural divisions, critiques about how much and what we consume and whether it's distracting us from taking action or from the truth and what the truth even is, definitely sounds relevant to our current time as well. And Godfrey concludes, quote, the 80s and 90s are perfect fodder for contemporary horror, providing nostalgia as well as a context that speaks perhaps to where we have ended up today. These are passionate tributes to their directors' childhoods, but dealing in fractured dreams. Good horror always finds the truth. End quote. Honestly, I see this even in the 2020 documentary Action Park about the faded amusement water park in New Jersey that led to several deaths and thousands of injuries over the years. I've mentioned the park a few times on this show, and the documentary that came out on HBO Max last summer is one of my favorite recent releases. And one reason that I like it so much is because the first half of the movie is former Action Park attendees and employees laughing about how wild and dangerous the park was, reminiscing about incidents and parties. And then the tone changes to one of reckoning with the harm caused. And by the end, you've got all these Gen Xers, most notably Chris Gethard, talking about how the way they were raised kind of sucked. And you have to either look at it with rose-colored glasses or with a supremely dark sense of humor, or else it would just be too tough to stomach. And I see that in the horror films and TV series coming out now that are set in the 80s, in you know, that sense of simplicity and wonder violently slashed away by the stark realities of the world. It might be particularly well illustrated by that era, and in some ways particularly parallel to aspects of the socio-political climate right now, but it's really just a great metaphor for adolescence overall, and I think that's why it works so well. And why this trend of 1980s period horror, like the invincible Mike Myers, just won't die. It's currently 97 degrees Fahrenheit here in New York City, with a heat index of 103, so I think it's safe to say that summer is well and truly here. And while I won't be spending any time outside today, summer is always a good time to load up on extra sunscreen. And today I stumbled on an article that now has me questioning how good my sunscreen actually is, especially here in the U.S., do you remember several years ago when every sunscreen brand suddenly started advertising with the words broad spectrum? That's because in 2011, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration introduced rules around that term. Here's what they said in a Q&A at the time, quote, Prior rules on sunscreens dealt almost exclusively with protection against sunburn, which is primarily caused by ultraviolet B or UVB radiation from the sun, and did not address ultraviolet A or UVA radiation, which contributes to skin cancer and early skin aging. 
After reviewing the latest science, FDA determined that sufficient data are available to establish a broad-spectrum test for determining a sunscreen product's UVA protection. Passing the broad-spectrum test shows that the product provides UVA protection that is proportional to its UVB protection. End quote. So basically, broad spectrum protects against both UVA and UVB rays, which is great, but Discover Magazine points out that this is but one example of how stringent the oversight of sunscreens is here in the US, where they're treated like an over-the-counter medication. Meanwhile, in the European Union, sunscreen is classified as a cosmetic. So in contrast to their cheese and chocolates, for which the EU has way stricter rules than the US does, they're actually more lax about their sunscreen. Now, being strict on something like sunscreen may sound good, but Discover Magazine argues it's actually beginning to limit us in our choices and keep us from some of the advances that other countries have been implementing. Take, for example, UV filters. It takes a lot longer for new active ingredients that act as UV filters to get approved in the US versus in the EU or some other nations. And some dermatologists suggest we're falling behind other nations who have better, more effective sunscreens. And returning to the matter of broad spectrum, this is one place where the EU is actually stricter. They have higher standards that sunscreen has to meet in order to be labeled broad spectrum. In the US, ours might actually be too low of a bar. Quoting Discover, In 2017, researchers put this possibility to the test by analyzing the UV blocking ability of 20 sunscreens for sale in the US. Though 19 of the 20 products for sale met US standards for broad spectrum, only 11 met European standards. End quote. The FDA has been working on trying to expedite the approvals process and in 2019 labeled a few new active ingredients that have been in use in other nations as generally recognized as safe, but there's still a long list of other ones just waiting to be approved before they can make it into the bottle of sunscreen that we purchase here in the US. I've got a bottle of sunscreen from a pre-Brexit trip to London that's been sitting in my bathroom unused for a while and starting to look better and better as an option. I spoke recently about my excitement around one of the new sports making its debut at the Tokyo Olympics next month, skateboarding, but it's just one of six new sports making their debut or triumphant return. The returning sports are baseball and softball, and the new ones are skateboarding as well as karate, surfing, and sport climbing. Only sport climbing is kind of a returning sport as well. Back around the turn of the 20th century, alpine climbing was an event in the Winter Olympics. Also called alpinism, it was named an official sport in 1894, but the first award wasn't handed out until 1924, at the first ever Winter Olympics in France. And it wasn't so much a sport that spectators would go see in conjunction with the rest of the Olympic Games as it was an honor bestowed on people who had achieved great feats in mountaineering recently. The first medal went to the team of the 1922 Mount Everest Expedition, the first focused effort to reach the top, or at least the first to make headlines around the world, though they didn't actually ever make it to the top. It marked the first and only time an Olympic medal has been awarded to a multinational team, according to Mental Floss. Unfortunately, a large number of the team who had gone on that expedition, mostly Sherpas, had died in the attempt, and George Mallory, one of the main mountaineers, died shortly after the award was announced on another Everest attempt of his. Lieutenant Edward Strutt, deputy leader on the expedition, accepted the medal on the team's behalf and vowed to one day take the medals to the summit of Everest, but he never did make it either. Further alpine climbing medals were awarded at the 1932 and 1936 games, but the alpine climbing medal did not return when the Olympics did following World War II, in part due to the International Olympic Committee's concerns with encouraging a sport in which so many of the medals had to be awarded posthumously. They did hand it out once more, though. At the 1988 Calgary Winter Games, Reinhold Messner and Jerzy Kukushka were given silver medals for climbing 14 of the world's 8,000-meter peaks. And as a nice footnote, ahead of the London Olympic Games in 2012, British mountaineer Kenton Cool got in touch with the grandson of one of the original mountaineers on that 1922 expedition in order to fulfill Lieutenant Strutt's promise that one of the gold medals they were awarded be taken to the summit of Mount Everest. And thanks to Cool, it finally was. 
Hopefully, the return of climbing to the Olympics this year will be sufficiently less fatal. Though I will say, if they want to keep adding sports, Baron Pierre de Coubertin, the first IOC president and man responsible for bringing back the Olympics in 1894, did originally envision that the games would include feats of aeronautics, for which a medal was awarded at the 1936 games, so maybe it's time for a comeback. All right, well, that is it for today. As always, this show was produced by Ride Home Media and Kotki.org. I am Jackson Bird, and I will talk to you again tomorrow.